yeah now as i said that earlier that we are going to have a dialogue in uh, uh, diabetes injectables um if you see that uh, if, uh, and uh, this is basically sponsored by l l e and company and all four of us have been contracted to speak about uh, especially about the injectables in diabetes and especially talking about uh, we're more concentrating on their products as well today now we are celebrating insulin uh, all of you know that uh, we are celebrating insulin uh, centenary this year actually it's a wonderful thing to see that um if, if uh, we're celebrating uh, 2021 uh, we think and if you look into that uh, uh, the 100 years celebrations of the uh, this year uh, completing 100 years of uh, discovery of insulin way back in 1921 all of us know that uh, banting and best with along with uh, colip and uh, macleod uh, they have discovered the insulin and then all the four of them have shared the nobel prize for that and i would like to remind the delegates that uh, this is probably in the medical history this is the only molecule which has got three nobel prizes so far just three nobel prizes the the, the time when it has uh, uh, discovered in 1921 where they got a nobel prize later on is over the development of insulin over the time is also included two more nobel prizes for this now uh in though it is discovered in 2021 it was first it was inoculated into a dog pancreatectomy is a dog and then he used to type 1 diabetic uh, boy and then you can see that in 1923 the first purified animal insulin uh, has been uh, available and you could see that it is having about 3 units per ml so you can see that this is 3 units per ml and in uh, and commercially available insulin was called as ilatin by l l l and company it is way back in 1923 where they were able to uh, make a insulin with various concentration like at 10 units per ml 20 units per ml 40 units per ml and 8 units per ml and then after about 27 years or 28 years later we are able to get the nph it's a natural prodamine hegeridon Um, you know the hegeridon the the biochemist who has made the uh, intermittent acting insulin in 1950 that made a huge difference in management of therapy because we were able to get a in those days we were able to get a good basal insulin at the time in the form of nph then of course then we had uh, um, various aspects most important thing is that uh, in 1973 they have standardized it is only it is 100 iu per ml but in india we get 40 iu per ml only in the bottles that we get and then the the you know the the longevity of diabetes is increasing and more and more people require insulin and so far we have been using in animal insulin and there was a state that we may if we don't have any human insulin that is recombinant dna synthetic insulin which is not available you know, it, it is not possible to kill animals to get the insulin from both pork and beef uh, that's sorry for the interruption sir uh, sir do you have the panel discussion slides Yes, yes. I'll come there. I know that. I know that. This is an introduction first, and then we'll have to do that. Okay, sir. Um, and then we have also the rapid-acting insulins. I'm telling about the development of insulin that in, as an introduction, and then so on. Like that, if you can see that uh, we had uh, glargine insulin in 2000, and then uh, we had uh, detimer in 2005, 2015, the Glutec, and fast-acting, uh, uh, fast-acting analog. Uh, in the form of uh, here um, um, uh, uh, lispro was available and then also later on we had a fast acting aspartic so that there is so much of development including um, uh, including insulin as well now the, the if you look into the relevance of uh, um, uh, insulin and its role in relevance in uh, we know that in type 1 and type 2 diabetes and as i said that uh, the longevity of type 2 diabetes is increasing and it's a question of time that most of our patients may require insulin even in type 2 diabetics and then as far as in type 1 diabetes is concerned there are so many challenges from neonates where you can see that the low insulin requirement and unpredictable and variable feeding patterns and in young children glycemic variability risk of hypoglycemia and dk has been a big, huge issue and reluctance of school to oversee the and administer a mul a multiple dose insulin requirement in children and in adolescent we have some other problems like missing the meal time bolus insulin and in adolescence you develop insulin resistance 
and uh, changes in sleep and activity pattern and so many things including their inner pump uh, they don't change it accordingly during exercise and all so there so many issues have been there similarly in type 2 diabetes you know that natural history of diabetes in such that over the time the beta cell numbers and uh, come down and then it's a question of time that we have to need insulin as well now uh, first let me look into the challenges to in the panel about type 1 diabetes um if if you look into that uh, in in the type 1 diabetes if you see um uh, um uh, let me ask uh, go with to dr suresh damodaran um what are the challenges associated with management of type 1 diabetes no uh, key challenges i have described you you can describe any other challenges dr suresh damodaran uh, good evening everyone uh, thanks for the opportunity um uh, thank you dr vijay kumar and uh, the key challenges are in my view uh for the type 1 diabetics is the age of diagnosis for example and if it is so young uh, there are a lot of challenges that comes with it even the precision dosing and other things and then if you go if you got a school going age there is a uh, parents reluctance of uh, accepting the child as a, a diabetic and then uh, going forward in the school for example they will be reluctant in giving the injections uh so the parents hesitation in getting an injection for a child in the school and then probably the meal and other things as a child uh and then the playing uh, not playing and other things with the child again uh probably the sleep pattern comes into play and then the devices insulin devices as i mentioned the precision if you can have it 0.5 and other things uh, that will be ideal and uh, in india there are a lot of weather changes as well especially in north and other places where the extreme weather can happen that can lead to a uh, uh, hypo and hyper uh, based on what it is and then the injection technique uh, so there are quite a lot of challenges uh, uh, involved but i think in primarily the time has to spend in one word i'll just narrate the time has to spend in diabetes education so i'll stop there a lot of multiple challenges challenges i quoted but the probable solution is diabetes education and length in spending for diabetes education uh, dr suresh do you think that uh, type 1 diabetes are better managed in the institutes where because you know the more a team can take care of a uh, type 1 diabetic compared to a single uh, doctor clinic or something else do you have any idea on that so uh, i think ideal scenario is different from what practically what we face up sir but i think uh, if you can imagine everybody is going to a primary institute that is not possible actually so uh we have to got uh, we have to manage with whatever the resources we got so as i said even if you are managing as an individual clinician you have to spend some time in type 1 diabetes education for the parents and the kids so if you can do that you don't need a tertiary center ideally probably you need a multiple team but in india places like india you can't afford it that's nice i think uh, that's more you have nailed the point that uh, you need to spend more time and the family should be involved in educating the both the patient as well as the family is the most important issue um that's uh, the thank you dr suresh and uh, let me uh, go to dr piyush desai dr piyush desai um uh, do you think that because you know you can see that uh, the type 1 diabetes is from neonates to adolescents um uh, do you have a, do you have, do you think that we have different strategies and different uh, glycemic goals for these people um uh, can you explain about that yeah so from neonates to adolescent uh, definitely neonates and a uh, very young children of around 3 year or 5 years a toddler uh, they are not uh, knowing about the sugar fluctuation by themselves their caretaker has to understand so definitely you uh, us fda has given and our american diabetic association has defined the goal for different population differently so we cannot target hbnc of 7 we have to keep realistic goal so if children who can take care themselves like adolescent and they, who are having less fluctuation we can target up to 7, 7 or less than 7 for toddler 7.5 to 8 is also acceptable range same similarly with neonates 7.5 to 8 is an acceptable range so that we can prevent hypoglycemia also and we can have a better quality of life okay thank you thank you dr piyush and then uh, let me go to dr um, supratik bhattacharya um sir uh, you know that uh, uh, you know when especially when you are trying to give insulin to uh, neonates and young children um, generally what we say is that we need to give one unit per kg body weight 
and uh, sometimes we need to go for smaller doses you know per day um, but most of our pens that we have uh, usually have but one unit uh, um, uh, one unit uh, um, uh, usually per, per um, 100, 100 iu per ml and, and and it is usually calculated when you, especially in a pen when you're trying to do that we get one unit uh, and uh, two units like that uh, do you think that in these uh, uh, special children uh, you know do you think that uh, we need to have a a different kind of a pen like something like a hemolog junior uh, where you got uh, uh, a 0.5 unit uh, precision dosing is possible do you think that uh, it's a good idea to have such a pen so that for children dr suprati yeah so uh, thank you dr vijay kumar for this question and i think uh, precise dosing is very important um, to prevent hypoglycemia uh, as well as so as you were saying you know uh, if you can go up by 0.5 instead of one unit uh, that makes uh, the precise pen uh, very accurate and uh, in this uh, individuals in this cohort of patients where you uh, want uh, absolute uh, precise dosing, I think uh, Quick Pen Junior is very, very helpful. We didn't have anything like this earlier. So I'm uh, very glad that uh, uh, Eli Lili has decided to launch this in India and it's now freely available. And saying that it's not just the, the, the neonates or the young children, but also the other end of the spectrum. For example, if you're considering type 2 diabetic individuals with CKD, elderly population, for example, who are frail individuals and are at risk for hypoglycemia, um, in those with liver impairment, for example. So all of these patients would actually benefit from this precise dosing. I think you don't have any other brand uh, uh, that we have this 0.5 units, if, I, if I'm right. Only I think uh, Lily has got this uh, 0.5 precise uh, precision insulin, if I'm right, Dr. Suprati? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then we'll yeah, next we'll go to uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, um, Dr. Piyush, um, can you tell us about, uh, um, you know, generally what we say is that, you know, in type 2 diabetes, um, uh, in UK PDS also at the end of uh, eight years, about 65% of the patients required insulin for control of diabetes. And of course, those are the days when uh, not many molecules are available, either they were on sulfonylurea or metformin or insulin, uh, and they didn't even even the combine the sulfonylurea and metformin during those days of UK PDS. But in general, what we see is that at the end of 10 years, uh, according to the natural list of diabetes, the beta cells comes down, most of our patients will require insulin. At the same time, we also feel that uh, never too late and then not too early uh, for insulin in type 2 diabetes. So can you, can, can you uh, and apart from that, you know, whenever we try to uh, put them on insulin therapy, um, uh, patients always do give resistance to, uh, patients always, always resist to take insulin therapy. And it's a challenge for us to convince them as well. And Dr. Piyush, uh, can you throw some light on um, uh, when and uh, and why should you use uh, insulin in type 2 diabetes and when would you like to start? And if at all you have decided to start in one particular patient, how do you convince them to take insulin? Yeah. Uh, as we, uh, as you rightly told, sir, that uh, we are delaying insulin most of the time and patients are also delaying because of fear of injectables. Mm -hmm. But when to start insulin? Very clear-cut demarcation. If patients comes to you with first-time diagnosis, uh, diabetes, with osmotic symptoms, weight loss, signs of uh, ketosis, definitely we have to start insulin initially to control insulin is type 2. And then after controlling, we may take out insulin and we can continue with oral drugs. But most of the time in our routine clinical practice, patient who fail to have a better control or to achieve targeted HbA1c over three to four drugs. These are the ideal patients where ideally we should start with basal insulin or premix insulin, or you may start with basal plus therapy, depends on the patient fasting and postant profile. I would say if HbA1c is more than nine, definitely yes. But if HbA1c is eight and patient is already on four or five therapy, then why to wait? which agent is going to control their glycemia from 8.5 to 7, which is our goal. Right. So I will suggest any uncontrolled diabetes, HbA1c with more than three or four drugs should be put on insulin therapy. And as far as barriers are concerned, see, patients are going to take insulin for the first time. 
so they will have apprehension as dr suresh damodaran rightly told that for a type 1 diabetic person also diabetes education is important so why diabetes occur how beta cell deficiency occur if we impart knowledge regarding this then they will consider insulin therapy there was one very good study by uh, lily uh, when physicians were see, uh, i mean there were questionnaire where physician side and uh, patient side were taken about insulin therapy and there was more inertia from physician level rather than a patient level so first we have to shed initial uh, inertia to start this thing and definitely a support staff who also help them to understand how to take insulin where to take insulin how to manage insulin if we give full knowledge they will definitely take insulin and over the period of time after corona and everything patients are already worried about uncontrolled diabetes we can impart a knowledge of having good sugar control and if they need sugar control with insulin patients are ready for take this excellent excellent uh, you, you clearly explained that if somebody is more than 3 or 4 drugs and that to in half maximal dose and then if the sugars are not under control why should we wait that's a very good answer that you have given and also i think spending time like you and dr suresh damodar has said educating and convincing people is a very important problem we need to spend extra time now um, uh, we know that uh, uh, you know there is more and more development of uh, the 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 type of insulins that we are getting uh, the improvements and the 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 feasibility of using insulins is becoming more and more and making it uh, keeping it simple and good and also Uh, uh making the quality of life of a patient very good say for example if you have a regular insulin the pharmacokinetics is such that we need to take insulin food is ready and you have to wait for 30 to 45 minutes and then you have to start the food so that it it really uh, matches the postprandial uh, blood sugar and also the peaking of uh, short acting insulin whereas analogs have come and then you can take the take the shot and take the food and in th- that is the way that even the uh, pharmacokinetics have changed and i, I think uh, uh, compared to this uh, human insulin the further development is analog insulins um and uh, dr supriti can you tell us about that uh, uh, how important is this you know the flexibility uh, the faster onset and shorter duration of action um uh, apart from what we have in the pharmacokinetics what are the Uh, um, other advantages by cho- uh, choosing analog insulins short acting analog insulins over uh, human insulin you can explain both uh, basal as well as so i think i think uh, thank you so much for the question uh, when it comes to uh, say achieving the target prandtl for example for the short acting analogs it's probably not very different between say uh, the older generation in- uh, insulins and the new ones but we are constantly bettering on ourselves and we have gone from short acting to ultra short acting now and the advantage as you correctly said is the flexibility so now patients can even take uh, the ultra short acting uh, insulins um, just after the meal and this the advantage is that they can do the carb counting and the best part is it it mimics the body's uh, physiology of insulin secretion and and it's very fast to act it does its job and then the the concentration uh, comes down so there is very very little chances of hypoglycemia so it's absolutely mimics body's physiology and as we said you know that you have flexibility so you can give it just prior to the meal or even a post meal and that's quite helpful at times because you know um, uh, they can precisely take uh, the insulin dose based on whatever uh, amount of carb they had taken so uh, this is preferred and i have had uh, studies done and and published uh, regarding this ultra short acting uh, insulins and in various cohorts again I, as i said uh, ckd patients as uh, the the kind of cohort that we worry about because uh, we we know that hypoglycemia is an issue there um, also the gdm patients again a very special cohort um, and also the elderly and frail individuals these are the kind of individuals uh, where you should be uh, thinking about short acting and ultra short acting insulin because timing uh, to take it say uh, 20 minutes prior to the meal is not very convenient for everyone and uh, uh, so thinking about patients convenience as well i think uh, you should be 
shifting to the newer analogs uh, if uh, feasible because price wise it's not hugely different and if they can actually afford it then uh, the analogy i give you is that if you can afford the newer generation cell phones you would not actually take a older version because of the n number of reasons that we have thank you uh, i think you have nailed it actually that is uh, that is uh, effective control of diabetes and it's not uh, uh, majorly different from regular insulin with uh, analog insulin and then you also said that about the safety especially uh, in general and as well as the um, uh, the people who are at risk uh, that is reduction of hypoglycemia is still effective in reducing hba1c so that improvement in the quality of life now um, um, we know that uh, basal bolus therapy um, is the best uh, uh, therapy most physiological way of giving insulin is a basal bolus therapy we know that um, uh, how about uh, um, uh, this thing you got any alternative because once you said that it is basal bolus therapy we need to give four injections if the patient is motivated yes we can continue to do that but if there is not motivated do you have any other options you know for example uh dr suresh damodaran can you do you think that you can explain uh, what factors has to be considered before choosing uh, either of the regimen like you know for example basal bolus therapy compared to if you have a premixed uh, uh, based insulin therapy either twice or tw- uh, thrice in a day so that you can reduce injection uh, number of injection so that the uh, uh, you know uh, other end of the prescription may improve do you think so dr suresh okay now uh my way of thinking is one size doesn't fit all uh, that is first thing and then the second thing is the convenience and compliance these are the things that should be thought about and once you think about convenience and compliance as you rightly said the basal bolus is the perfect one which will mimic physiological response of insulin secretion so no question about it uh but there are a lot of challenges to it probably four injections a day happens but uh, i think uh, the way the way uh, you have to think is just for your patient who is having a carbohydrate meal and uh, as you know the indian physicians think um, uh, uh, more of having a, a premix insulin the reason for that is uh, because it's just convenient twice daily insulin and the second issue is the carbohydrate load uh, can be variable and especially with the asian patients like us uh, the carbohydrate amount content is quite high then uh, the amount of injection is less so that's why the uh, uh, practically pragmatically why uh, uh, the a- analog uh, mix insulins are preferred but however as i mentioned basal bolus or complete uh, resemblance of a uh, uh, of a physiological response of insulin but for convenience and compliance also there are excellent evidences uh, with uh, analog uh, biphasic analogs uh, it has been used as well so if you look at any guidelines for the matter it is just to uh, immediately uh, any guidelines will say start on a basal insulin but however i think you have to look at your own patients and act accordingly that is my point so again convenience and compliance has to be looked into do you think that we can approach differently for type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the same question well type 1 diabetes no question i think uh, uh, young or old probably basal bolus is better no question about it if we can afford it and if they uh, if the education goes in and basal bolus is definitely better that's what i prefer uh, but a lot of other patients then you, you go for a mix analogs it works beautifully um, especially <laughs> uh, especially cardiac patients and patients who are reluctant to go on insulin and people who has got more carbohydrate load quite a lot of uh, places you can use mix insulin okay um, uh, uh, see our indian patients are different you know um, uh, so uh, uh, in in many ways you know the indian phenotype uh, in, in indian phenotype itself is different and then the dietary habits are different in our country um, and then we may have to have a different choice of insulin combinations for example uh you have this hemolog mix uh, uh, 25 where 25% of it is a short acting analog and then 75% of it is uh, uh, intermediate acting uh, component uh, similarly you can got mix 50 whereas 50 50 that is 50 short acting uh, component and then 50% of it is uh, uh, intermediate acting component 
Now, um, what makes these uh, two types of insulins, you know, which are available, which are relevant, are relevant for Indian scenario and why? Uh, Dr. Piyush Desai, can you explain about this? Uh, definitely, uh, in India, we have STAR study, uh, we have multiple other studies which have shown that either it is Northern India, Southern India, Eastern India or Western India, everywhere we are simple carbohydrate eaters. And post sugar elevation is always, always a big challenge to us. So when we start basal insulin alone, either we should have OAD to support the post peak, otherwise basal insulin alone cannot achieve HbA1c of 7.5. So definitely we have pre-mix options available. Now in pre-mix, traditionally what we are using is either 30-70, that is 70% long acting and 30% short acting or 25-75 analog, what uh, humolog people are having. But there are number of people who are either having brunch there are a number of people when we are doing CGMS, distinctively they have post breakfast sugar, which is highest of the day. So to cut down that peak, we need shorter bolus part more if we are choosing for a pre-mix standard regime. So here the role of pre-mix 50-50 is. So we can give this injection 50-50 at that particular meal because Premix analogs can be used three times a day. So if the insulin requirement is quite stable and we do not need flexibility like basal bolus regime, we can use 50-50 in the morning, 50-50 in the afternoon and 25-75 in the evening. By that way also we can cut down one prick if we really want to go. And sometimes just 50-50 twice daily at two major meals, especially when post-breakfast sugar is high, uh, instead of 25-75 giving 50-50 helps a lot. So we can use different variation as per the patient need. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the time, sir. And then I think uh, Humaloy mix 25 at night may be the best idea because it can bring down the hepatic glucose output and a fasting blood glucose better because... 75% of the component is intermittent acting. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, then we'll, we'll go to the next section uh, about uh, special populations. This is very important. Now, so far we have spoken about uh, uh, many things about in general. A and then uh, we have, uh, uh, you, you know, that the, some of the special uh, situations that we can think about today for the discussion is, uh, uh, you know, uh, human insulin versus analog insulin in uh, gestational diabetes mellitus. And then choosing the right insulin for, uh, you know, CKD and as well as the chronic liver disease. And most important thing, the most important thing is that the, the role of insulin, various insulin therapy, insulins that are available uh, in case of usage of uh, steroids. You know, all of us know that uh, off late because of the uh, different situation that we are going through, any COVID-19 patient admitted in the hospital are put, most of them are put on, majority of them are put on uh, steroids. And after giving steroids in the hospital at the time of discharge also, they are on steroids over the time and they're being uh, um, tapered. Now, if you look into that, we can, uh, most of the times what we see is that this is the intermittent acting uh, steroids, which we usually look into that. Whereas uh, hydrocortisone, which is a short acting and dexamethasone long acting are given in the hospital. And mostly, sometimes it is given in the hospital. But most of the times what I see in the practice in the hospital sees that most of them use this intermittent acting uh, uh, after using the dexamethasone. Later on, they switched over to prednisolone or methylprednisolone. And that will be continued uh, at the time of discharge. So we have a different, uh, you know, the uh, pharmacokinetics of each one and each one has got a different mineralocorticoid and, uh, you know, the glucocorticoid effect and which is this hydrocortison has got the least uh, glucocorticoid effect and more mineralocorticoid and these are more glucocorticoid effect and less of mineralocorticoid effect, these intermittent acting and long acting uh, steroids. Now this uh, puts a challenge. Uh, now, uh, let me go to Dr. Supratik and, um, you know, when, when somebody is on steroids, especially systemic steroids, and already they're hyperglycemic because of uh, various factors, including COVID-19, uh, do you think that uh, in, in these situations, postprandial hyperglycemia is the main culprit? 
and uh, what are the uh, challenges that you usually face in managing hyperglycemia due to scenario that is number 1 you can also ac- uh, uh, simultaneously answer the second question um uh, what uh, uh, role can uh, you know the, the concentrated type of bolus insulin which is available 200 iu uh, usually we get 100 iu we have 200 iu um, do you have this uh, what is the role for this 200 iu pen during steroid effect dr suprati yeah so thank you so much again all very really pertinent question just quick reference to the gdm that you were talking about so we have reference um or you know data in respect of uh, aspart and lisp in gdm uh, glue lysine does not have any data in gdm okay so the dictum is you want to use shorter acting insulins um and and preferably ultra short acting insulins now when it comes to uh, those patients who are in icu or hdu setup you prefer a uh, full on basal bolus uh, regimen uh, because that's easier oh, yeah. titrate now once the challenge comes is when they are discharged uh, for most of them who had been insulin naive and just been started on insulin they do not prefer four prits and that becomes a big challenge to decide you know like and so it all depends on what kind of uh, you know like the steroid has been used whether it's a long acting steroid which which is used once daily or is it twice daily and you decide on your uh, insulins based on that but the dictum is if they're under ic or hd setup go for basal bolus and once they're out then you can step down on the insulins and decide um, so there are various uh, Uh, you know if if i think for a long period of time the glycemia persists uh, post steroid use and uh, it's not uncommon that we see that uh, the the glycemia persists for at least 3 months post a discharge for whatever reason so completely taking out the basal component is probably not a good idea so i think the basal component has to be there and then you decide whether you want to go for a basal plus or plus plus or still you want to continue with a full on basal bolus uh, coming to the second question so uh, you know the concentrated insulins are very helpful when the dose requirements are very high so um, i think u200 uh, lispro that is available is quite convenient when you have a higher requirement in general you uh, i think when you have a higher requirement i think you know at uh, 200 iu Uh, yeah. will be easier i think you know, the amount of force that you need to give the amount of insulin that and you need smaller to volume to so it's it's more acceptable, acceptable. and easier yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you thank you um, um see looking into uh, ckd and cld this is another very uh, you know a very difficult situation uh, many a time especially in ckd uh, most of the times we require less dose of insulin and then some ckd patient require large dose only because insulin resistance that they have um so dr suresh namodaran um uh, what is the right insulin regimen for these patients both you can explain quickly on ckd and cld and then do you think that in these situations where uh, the, the, the earlier has been uh, what what we are seen in uh, uh, type 1 diabetics point for unit precision dosing do you think that they are useful in this situation absolutely uh, the in ckd and uh, the chronic kidney disease and chronic liver disease the challenge is uh the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics dynamics are affected and there is more chance of hypoglycemia that's num- point number 1 and uh, second i think uh the the gluconeogenesis the two major organ for gluconeogenesis is liver and kidney and when you got a failure or uh, when you got challenges in the function then i think we are talking about a uh, risk of hypos being more higher so again for that reason of getting more uh, variable blood sugar uh obviously insulin is the preferred uh, medicine that's number 1 mm-hmm. and number 2 if you want to uh, uh do uh, reducing dose and to prevent hypoglycemia should be the motive uh you can use a precision dose of 0.5 that can be used so uh the answer is the real challenges of with pk pk and pd uh, pharmacokinetics and dynamics and then there will be challenges with uh, hypoglycemia risk is being so high you can use uh, reducing dose or a small dosage of insulin um if you want to use mixer in mixed insulin or basal bolus but preferably less amount of pricks will be better 
uh, but i think the precision dose will be uh, playing a big role here thank you dr suresh and quickly dr piyush uh, how about uh, uh, using insulin pregnancy why is insulin preferred choice in managing hypoglycemia in pregnancy and um, um, how do you uh, choose the right insulin regimen uh, what what type of insulin would you like to suggest as, in pregnancy as far as yeah. all guidelines are there insulin is the only choice mm. even if we are using metformin quite a lot nowadays but still it is scheduled b drug and it is no not yet accepted in any guideline because of the mild safety concern especially iugr and uh, um, small gestational age babies so insulin is always the first choice and i will say insulin should be the last choice you can add metformin to each other and accept that no other drug except uh, small studies i mean two three studies supporting glibenclamide no other mm. drug has been studied as far as insulin regime is concerned usually gdm patients are having postprandial fluctuations yes and to cut down we need to give prandial insulin all three or four times a day whenever patient is taking larger meal preferably insulin analogs are better agent two uh, reason one patient can track any time because during pregnancy usually they feel nauseating senses and they can uh, eat properly they may not eat properly so it is better to take injection just at the time of uh, a uh, meal and it they are faster acting injection and in pregnancy the first hour insulin peak uh, first hour sugar peak is highest so if we give analog they give do give better result but later on may patient require basal insulin as an addition to prandial insulin if their blood sugar level especially fasting sugar level is going more than 100 but at the same time type 2 diabetic who become pregnant type 1 diabetic who become pregnant basal bolus therapy from day first is the answer thank you thank you i think there is an accelerated fasting in pregnancy that's why they usually in where the fasting will be normal in gestation diabetes and that is the reason daytime hyperglycemia is the most important to be uh, contained uh, thank you and then we'll finish with this we're running short of time quickly we'll go through the uh, uh, the incretin um, uh, defect uh, in type 2 diabetes Uh, we know that uh, uh, we know that uh, the, especially in uncontrolled diabetes, the uh, the glucagon is higher, and then uh, uh, there, there is always uh, DPP four, um, and that, that is the GLP one and, and GIP are secreted from the GI tract, and then they are short lived, and then especially in in uncontrolled diabetes, they are uh, inactivated by DPP four enzyme. so we got uh, gliptins which have been there to restrict the dp4 enzyme so that we get more of active glp1 and gap uh, that is one way of looking into that uh, usually they are quite effective well tolerated and also uh, weight neutral and generally cardiovascular safe now that is not sufficient uh, now you have uh, one more incretin based therapy in the form of injectables that is glp1 receptor analogs which are resistant to dpp4 enzyme and so the glp1 is given uh, uh, in, in, in given uh, as it is resistant to dpp4 enzyme uh, it, it works better uh, and then we got its own uh, advantages by giving glp1 receptor analog like improving the endogenous uh, dp uh, the the glp uh, incretin incretin levels we know that uh, it increases the glucose uptake by increasing the insulin and then also reduces the glucagon so that hepatic glucose output production comes down so we get both fasting and postprandial blood glucose control that all of us know about that now uh, um, uh, now if we can see that uh, uh, because of this today we are going to talk, uh, talk about only the glp analogs especially the allylyl is uh, uh, wonderful molecule in the form of once a week dulaglutide once a week dulaglutide which is available and let us look into the approach to that now if you look into that uh, 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 hba1c reduction if you can see that uh, across the table including in ckd across the table whether you are using with the basal insulin or we, along with other insulin therapies or whether you using with sulfonylurea metformin combination therapy and then you use it with the insulin without insulin only with oral drugs with insulin with oral drugs and in ckd you could see that definitely Uh, there is uh, uh, a reduction of hba1c of almost 1.4 in rcts and then if you can see that even in the real world uh, you can see that 
anything between 0.5 to 2.2 percent HPONC reduction has been found in uh, with uh, uh, dulaglutide. <clears throat> and then similarly, if you can see that the weight reduction, if you see that it's a very good weight reduction again. Um, uh, weight reduction is something uh, uh, very good that you can uh, uh, you can see with this. Uh, compared to glargine, uh, there is a, a very significant reduction in uh, weight reduction. And it is comparable, if you look at comparable to the other uh, GL1 analog in the form of uh, uh, liraglutide, when it is given at the maximum dose, when it is given at the maximum dose of 1.8 milligrams, uh, there is an extra 700 grams weight reduction uh, compared to 1.8 maximum dose of liraglutide. Now, um, in the real world data, if you see that there is, uh, if, uh, though it is different about uh, about two, two, uh, three to four kilos, what we see in uh, uh, in the RCTs. Whereas in real world data, we can see that it varies from almost two to six point five kilo weight reduction we see in the real world studies. And in our practice, in fact, most uh, many people got even ten to fifteen uh, kg reduction as well. But in general, we see that almost up to six kilo weight reduction has been um, uh, there is been there. So uh, uh, you can see that at this state, um, with this uh, evidence, can Dr. Supriti, um, can you suggest me that uh, uh, suppose, for example, uh, uh, you can can you comment about the durability of most of our oral drugs that we use, and then also when you're trying to use the, use this GLP-1 analog along with the drugs such as SGLT inhibitors or metformin. And do you think that the effectiveness of this GLP-1 analog also uh, depends on the baseline HbA1c and as well duration of diabetes? And comparably, what is the uh, uh, durability compared to other oral drugs such as SGLT2 and other insulins and uh, other uh, sufferings as well, other oral drugs as well? Yeah, so thank you again for a very pertinent question. I think the best form of treatment nowadays is, uh, you know, uh, probably a combination of incretin based therapies and uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor because it uh, sort of addresses most number of, uh, you know, sides of the ominous octet as proposed by the Ralph E. Fronzo. And uh, we knew that the older generation uh, uh, OHAs that were there, they used to put the beta cells on an overdrive and, uh, and eventually they were destined to fail. And uh, so the newer generation uh, OHAs that are there, like the DPP-4 inhibitors, for example, um, or the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, which uh, do not put the cells on overdrive, are probably a better way to approach uh, diabetes uh, pathophysiologically. And uh, the best thing about the GLP-1 receptor analogs is that it pushes the endogenous uh, uh, GLP-1 concentration to a super physiological level. So that has got certain advantages, which is not uh, sort of, uh, you don't get that with the DPP-4 inhibitor use. For example, a reduction in the appetite, increased satiety, for example, and uh, these are the kind of things that are added benefits on uh, pushing the endogenous GLP-1 levels to a super physiological levels. So uh, obviously, that translates also into a higher HbA1c reduction, and uh, you know uh, it's it's probably very pathophysiological because you know it has its action. Uh, the incretins has its action both on the beta cells as well as uh, the alpha cells, thus ensuring uh, glucose homeostasis. So you ensure that it, you'd never have hypoglycemia at all. And uh, the best thing is you can combine with any form of uh, therapy for that matter. You can use a GLP-1 receptor analog with the insulin. You can use it with the SGLT2 inhibitor, as we said. That's probably most pathophysiological along with the metformin, but also even with other uh, other OHAs and other uh, anti-diabetic agents as well. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Dr. Supratik. And then uh, Dr. Piyush, um, you know, um, um, the, the benefits of uh, glycemic control and additional benefit of weight loss uh, depends on uh, the doses that we use. Do you think that uh, the once a week, which is very useful, uh, uh, a fixed dose of 1.5 uh, compared to any other things, do you have any idea about your, in your usage, what do you find the uh, advantage? Yeah. 
even with lira glutide the uh, previous molecule uh, which is used daily 1.2 1.8 is used for diabetes control but uh, lira glutide 3 mg has shown a good weight loss like this even with dula glutide 0.75 when we escalate to 1.5 it gives good weight loss as well as glycemic control and here i would like to say in real life when we are starting glp1 it is always from patient side that they enjoy having better glycemic control with weight loss because there are only few molecules who can really does that where we are controlling hb1c also and even though patients are losing weight and the higher doses has been has been shown to have more weight loss with glycemic control so even dulaglutide very occasionally one i have used twice daily also with more weight loss uh, mm -hmm. but i will say it is very uh, occasional use but yeah. in real life they do give more weight loss and with a very good glycemic control and uh, even lily people are coming with higher dose also for dulaglutide okay okay thank you um uh, dr suresh uh, uh, do you think that uh, in in your experience i think you are one uh, you also use very frequently uh, the glp analogs how quickly you get this fasting post pain hb1c reduction well, i'll keep it very short uh, around 3 uh, to 4 weeks you can see the response uh, there is uh, in practical uh, i think it's almost comparable with the data available 3 to 4 weeks normally you see the data uh, the uh, the response okay good thank you very nice um see uh, uh the the whenever we trying to treat a patient you know we don't try to treat hyperglycemia alone we also look into some pleiotropic benefits in, especially in the uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, you know, cardiovascular uh, benefits that we always think about that and even if us fda insists upon any new molecule which comes we need to go through the uh, cardiovascular safety now uh, in this particular uh, trial rewind trial we can see that um, uh, the there is uh, if you can see in this uh, when uh, the dulaglutide is used over 6 and a half years we can see that compared to placebo dulaglutide uh, dulaglutide uh, is able to reduce the, the 12% hazard ratio reduction in cardiovascular disease now the most interesting part is that Uh, whether you having a prior cbd or no prior cbd that is normal people the same benefit has been found here you can see that the hazard ratio is 0.87 and 0.8 so there's over 13% reduction in cardiovascular disease when you use dulaglutide this is a very good report so it looks like there may be uh, uh, there may be having some amount of primary prevention as well apart from secondary prevention so let us discuss about this dr supriti um uh, i mean uh, with this background of uh, you know uh, 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 they were even with uh, probably a prior a primary prevention with this particular molecule which is not uh, seen in other uh, glp analogs um do, do you think that uh, you would like to use this uh, uh, drugs after stratifying the type 2 diabetic patients at risk uh, and how many uh, i mean it is also said there about two thirds of our people that be having that uh, type 2 diabetes will be having either symptomatic or asymptomatic cardiovascular disease and how do you stratify very quickly yeah so i think uh, rewind was very unique in many sort of way but the best thing was it mimicked our clinical practice so all other prior cardiovascular outcome trials those were mainly meant for those who already had an event here it's only 30% of the patients with actual events in the past but majority of them had risk factors but did not have an event but in spite of that it clearly went on to prove that uh, dulaglutide is the only molecule which has got Uh, very clear evidence in terms of both primary as well as secondary prevention which was not even shown with liraglutide or even uh, semaglutide in the sustain 6 also you know the the baseline hva once it was quite low as compared to the other cardiovascular outcome trials the number of females that were recruited was much higher and obviously because it was an event driven trial and the the baseline uh, uh, population recruited with actual events was very less that's why the duration of the study was quite long so it was about 5.6 years which was unlike any other prior cardiovascular outcome trials so canadian uh, guidelines has now put this uh, and they have updated their guidelines and now dulaglutide there can be used for primary uh, prevention so that that's 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 welcome 
Dr. Piyush, to accept what Dr. Suprit, uh, Supratik has said that uh, uh, in our clinical practice, we can use this for primary prevention. Yes or no? Yeah, definitely, yes. And revenge uh, population, as Dr. Supratik told, is quite similar to what we are seeing in our clinical practice. Yes. Uh, Dr. Suresh, quickly, uh, see the follow-up of almost about five and a half years uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, revenge trial. Uh, indicates that there's a lot of durability and a long-term safety cardiovascular. Do you agree? Absolutely. No, I think uh, the longer the duration of the trial, and it's much more reassuring, even a clinical trial setup, if you can do a trial for five and a half years, uh, that is reassuring. You can translate to clinical practice within no time. And then you can explain to the patient that uh, 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 not one or two years, but almost like five and a half, six years, patients had maintained the HbA1c, maintained the weight loss, and maintain the other cardiometabolic benefits. Now, I think this is an important uh, finding in Rewind is that both for primary and as well as secondary, as long as close to six years, we're able to do that. And then probably this can be extended in a real world, probably for longer period. Thank you. And then uh, let us look into that, uh, whether uh, the trulicity, uh, that is the duraglutide, uh, can be useful in CKD patients. Um, uh, can it can be useful in CKD patients or not? Dr. Suresh, uh, up till what EGF for limit that uh, uh, this uh, dualaglutide can be used in type well, of situation? Well, I think, uh, again, uh, I don't want to go into the detail, but I think we will keep it simple. Somewhere around uh, maximum of 30 of EGFR, you can use it. And uh, you can start with mild renal impairment and you can go up to maximum using of 30 uh, un uh, until you get the uh, confidence enough. Okay. So not can, I just, can I just put it in? Yeah, so yeah, please, please, do, yeah. do, uh, GFR is up to 15 for dualic now. Yeah. Okay. So okay. we can use it up to 15. Okay. Okay. I think uh, I think both Dr. Supratik and uh, Dr. Piyush and Dr. Suresh have got experience in using this molecule in CKD patients as well. Now, uh, uh, let us look into the, uh, you know, the adherence to the uh, prescription and persistence of therapy is a very, very important, especially with molecules of GLP-1 analog, which has got a lot of uh, side effects, especially GA side effects are very common. Um, if you look into this one particular graph uh, uh, at the end of uh, 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 once-weekly trulicity, if you can see that compared to everything, and these are the ones which you can see that the exenatide, lexacenatide, um, exenatide BAD, um, that is uh, uh, once a week and exenatide BAD, and then uh, 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 liraglutide as well. If you compare to all these things, you can see that duloglutide seems to be having a better persistent adherence to the prescription compared to other molecules. That is number one point. And also, if you look into that, uh, according to the award trial programs that were done with uh, GLP and analog duloglutide, the adverse event seems to be not different from the other, um, other uh, uh, GLP and analogs as well. So one of the things probably is that uh, uh, this is probably more acceptable by people. That is the reason persistence of the prescription even at the end of one year has been found. Now, quickly, we are running short of time. Uh, quickly, Dr. Suprati, uh, what are the main reasons for discontinuous therapy uh, apart from cost? Um, uh, and uh, how do you reduce the GI uh, side effects? Yeah, so again, a very practical question. So anyone being offered a once weekly therapy versus once daily or uh, twice daily, obviously is going to choose once weekly. So that naturally converts into a better uh, compliance. And that is what we have seen from the very studies done with dulaglutide versus the other GLP-1 receptor analogs. Um, mm -hmm. Also, the elegance of the pain, uh, it's very, very different looking from an actual insulin pen. So the perception that they're not using insulin is quite an assurance for the patients as well. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the question that you uh, asked, so we need to educate the patient so they should not so it's more sort of relevant for the shorter acting uh, GLP receptor analogs but yet in general for any GLP-1 receptor analog they should be placed at a time when the patient is relatively empty stomach so they should not be having a big fatty meal so uh, uh, that 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 would uh, ensure reduction in the GI side effects also go slow and uh, go, uh, up titrate very slowly take your time up titrating so uh, you can start with 0.75 and then up to 1.5 dulaglutide. And uh, also, 
uh, you can use uh, simple uh, ways of you know using a PPI, for example, to mitigate or or a domperidone to uh, get rid of the nausea, and that really helps. But as long as you have talked to the patient, that helps. And I think Dr. Supratik, you will agree with me that uh, most of the uh, GI side effects on the first four to six weeks and after that, they usually settle down. And I Absolutely. think reassuring the patient is very important to continue the good molecules such as dulaglutide so that we can yeah. get better. So, and, and usually it's during the first two or three days and then it uh, wanes off and also uh, more during the first three injections or so. So yeah. from fourth injection onwards, uh, the GI side effects significantly usually come down. Yeah, so better to go slow and then up tight rate. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Dr. Suresh, I think uh, uh, this has got a unique, uh, um, uh, especially the dulaglutide uh, uh, trulicity. Um, the device that you inject uh, this molecule is something unique. Um, uh, so do you think how easy to demonstrate device? And then um, uh, in, in your experience, what are the GI side effects with trulicity? Well, I think uh, coming to the device, the one thing I liked about it is the design who had done it, I think it's a genius because the the way the needle is not shown, uh, I, I haven't seen my 23 years of experience, not seen any device like that without a needle is being shown outside. So that is uh, a fabulous thing for the starters. But a lot mm -hmm. of people who started using it, they find it much more uh, convenient. So don't have any complaint about the pen. And in fact, it's a much uh, bonus uh, in terms of not having the needle shown. That's number one. And uh, the the second question is, uh, what is the second question? A second question is that, uh, uh, how about uh, your experience uh, uh, in uh, patients? From uh, GI side, uh, side effects, yeah. Side effects. Well, I think it's nausea, as uh, Supratik was mentioning, nausea and uh, uh, vomiting sort of feeling. And But it is initially, uh, but it can be easily managed by PPI and... Uh, uh, Antiemetics for three to seven days, and it helps a lot. And uh, after that, normally it settles down. But counseling the patient, saying that there is a possibility of it, and that might avoid it rather than having it. Um, in the last question of our session is that to Dr. Piyush. Um, uh, because we're running short of time, I'm cutting down a few questions. Uh, and uh, Dr. Piyush, do you think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we are using it concurrently, the the dilaglutide and along with the insulin, uh, there there is there is general thinking that uh, the there is better control of diabetes with reduction in insulin dose. Um, and, and do you have an experience in that? Because that may improve the adherence and persistence of the therapy. What is your experience when you are using concomitantly both insulin as well as uh, uh, GLP one analog? Uh, uh, I will say using GLP-1 analog like dulaglutide along with basal insulin is a good alternative to basal bolus therapy sometimes. Okay. If we are not too late to start insulin, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because it controls post prenatal peak nicely and basal mm. insulin cover the fasting uh, sugar. And mm. along with that, if we give this injection, it is going to cause weight loss even if patient is on insulin. Okay. That's why insulin doses goes down. And because of the convenience of once weekly doses, along with only insulin, what patient has to take daily, overall compliance and all other things are also quite acceptable to the patient. At the same time, because of addition of this molecule and weight loss, sometimes patients need not to reduce sulfonylurea also. And their overall improvement, because many times I have seen patients on GLP-1 come that I am feeling good after this injection. That okay. feel good factor is always there and that improves compliance and that gives better glycemic control. Also. And I think that uh, that's a very nice point you said that, you know, that feel good factor, you know, that improves the quality of life of a person. Weight reduction with a good glycemic control and with probably a primary okay. prevention or even a secondary prevention of CVD. I think these are the things that we need to look into that. Uh, these are advantages that we have to use it uh, towards our patients for betterment of their life. Um, it's an excellent session. Uh, uh, the last one hour, it just flew away. The time has flown away. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Eli Lilly for giving this opportunity. I would like to, uh, my profuse thanks to uh, the well-learned um, panelists, uh, Dr. Suresh Damodar and Dr. Piyush Desai and uh, Dr. Supratik Banerjee. Uh, All good things have to come to an end sometime. 
and i think such a good session on this uh, on injectables in type 2 diabetes is an excellent i would like to thank the panelists for their excellent contribution i am sure um, the delegates would have uh, enjoyed the information that has been imparted thank you very much A round of applause for dr vijay kumar for moderating the session so nicely and thank you pansi sabu team